Hi, good morning. Thank you guys so much. I was going to do this in Romanian, but it'd be really short uh, if I did. Um, but we are microbiome labs, so obviously we have a significant focus on the microbiome and microbiota itself. Um, and what we're going to talk about is root cause of chronic illness. And, and it fits quite well with the theme so far on metabolic syndrome and obesity and so on. So the, the involvement of the microbiota or dysfunctional microbiota, which d seems to drive a root cause within these conditions. So uh, we were looking at probiotics first. And you know, most of you are familiar with probiotics. You've used them for constipation, diarrhea, bowel irregularities. Uh, but we were looking at the function of a probiotic, if it could really help with conventional uh, or with chronic illness, what would be the most important function of a true probiotic? And we came to the conclusion that it has to protect its host, right? And protect the host from what? Well, actually, it protects the host from what we all do every single day, which is uh, arguably the most toxigenic thing we all do, and that's eating food, right? The process of eating food, just the process of digesting alone, if you suffer from dysbiosis, causes an, a toxic reaction within your body that seems to be at the root cause of most of these metabolic and other chronic diseases. And I'll show you some of that evidence as well. So it causes this phenomenon called metabolic endotoxemia, right? So metabolic endotoxemia is basically chronic low-grade persistent inflammation. It's an initiation of your innate immune response to the process of digesting food. Now, foods that are high in fat and high in calories seem to initiate this particular phenomenon even more. In fact, foods that are high in saturated fats drive it even higher than other types of fats. So that may be the molecular link between the, the over intake of uh, saturated fat and the causation of obesity, metabolic syndrome, heart disease, and so on. The condition is characterized by this increased serum um, LPS, uh, lipopolysaccharide, and meals, as I mentioned, that are high in fat and dense in calories seem to impact the effect even more. The increase in serum endotoxin is quickly followed by elevated inflammation. Uh, it's followed by the upregulation of interleukin-6, of interleukin-1-beta, interferon gamma, triglycerides, and then it also causes a disruption in postprandial insulin. The chronic metabolic endotoxemia has been associated with several uh, well-known conditions, of course, like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, hypogonadism, uh, autoimmunity, and so on. I'll show you a glimpse of the, of the research on each of these. Uh, there's a limited amount of time. I could flood you with a whole bunch of studies, but we wanted to be able to show you a glimpse of each of these as we go along. So what is this endotoxin? I think most of you are familiar with LPS, which is a function, uh, or sorry, a characteristic of gram-negative bacteria that sits in the cell membrane structure of the gram-negative bacteria. It's an inflammatory immunogen. It's got these two uh, really important structure, which is the core polysaccharide, the O antigen, and then the fatty acid tail. The fatty acid tail is the part that conveys the toxicity of LPS. Now, when LPS is sitting in the cell, it doesn't cause any sort of toxicity or any problem. In fact, it's used as an immunogen, it's used for signaling, it's used uh, for binding capacity to the mucosa, but when LPS is released from the cell, when the cell dies, that's when it can become an issue. The toxicology, as I mentioned, is conveyed by this lipid A portion. So here's what's happening in general, right? So this is a healthy microbiota um, and, and, and a healthy intestinal epithelium as well. So you've got the microbiota that exists in the top part of the mucosal layer. Now the inner part of the mucosal layer is an inner sanctuary where these microbes shouldn't exist. And when you start getting translocation of these microbes to the inner part of the mucosa, you start activating the inflammatory response in the body. This translocation is characteristic in numerous conditions like Crohn's, colitis, even colorectal cancer. Now what starts to happen in this process is you start with dysbiosis. You've heard that term. Uh, Professor Hammer talked about dysbiosis. He mentioned it in a few slides. But what is dysbiosis, right? Dysbiosis just generally means uh, imbalance of good and bad bacteria. When you look at a decade's worth of microbiome research, there is a fairly well characterized dysbiosis that seems to be present in most of these chronic illnesses. The first one is low levels of keystone strains. 
So within the microbiota, they've identified strains that play a pivotal role in maintaining health and wellness and also maintaining the integrity of the rest of the population. So some of these strains, for example, are, oh, I don't have it here, but Acromantium eusinophila or Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi. Acromantia mucinophila, for example, should make up between 5 and 7% of a healthy microbiota. When you have up to 1,000 organisms in a microbiota, if one species makes up 5 to 7%, that means it's a really important predominant species. There are over 200 clinical trials published showing that Acromantia mucinophila is inversely correlated to most conditions under the metabolic syndrome spectrum. In fact, in vitro and animal studies, uh, and actually so far there's one human study as well, interventionally when you add in acromantium eosinophila into a microbiota, it can actually reverse the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. So it seems to play a really important role in protecting the body against metabolic syndrome. Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi is a really well-known uh, strain within the microbiota that is inversely correlated with uh, Crohn's, colitis, and other forms of inflammatory bowel conditions as well. Now, when you end up with low keystone strains, you also end up with something called low diversity. Now, diversity in the microbiota is important to note that it's measured in two ways. Number one, it's the richness in the microbiota, so how many different bacteria you have in your population, but it's also uniformity. Uniformity seems to be quite important in the microbiota because you could have a microbiota with a rich population, meaning you have seven, eight, nine hundred different species, but if a handful of them or 10% of them are predominant and the rest are at really low levels, you still don't have diversity. In fact, some studies are coming out showing that diversity in the microbiota is also associated with longevity in general. So health and wellness seems to be impacted by these two factors, low keystone strain and low diversity. When you have low keystone strains and low diversity, you start to see a disrupted mucosal structure. So the physical structure of the mucosa, of course, the mucin that's produced is, stim is done so by the goblet cells. But how do the goblet cells produce mucin? Well, they're stimulated by short-chain fatty acids. And short-chain fatty acids are predominantly produced by these types of keystone strains in the lower bowel. When you have a disrupted mucosa, you start to get translocation of the normal commensal bacteria to the inner part of the mucosa. This translocation to the inner part of the mucosa causes a disrupted mucosal immune system response. So what you tend to get is a, um, a significant activation of the innate immune response in the mucosa all the time, chronically. This is a major feature of something called HIV enteropathy, which is the biggest driver of mortality in HIV, according to a 2014 NIH study. Uh, eventual inflammation in this inner part of the mucosa causes a dysfunction in the barrier structure in the intestinal epithelium itself, so uh, a dismantling of the tight junctions, um, low um, uh, turnover of these cells, the epithelial cells, and eventually you get too many things leaking through, especially this lipopolysaccharide, the endotoxin. Right, so when the lipopolysaccharide leaks, leaks through, what it does is it initiates this immune cascade starting with the binding of CD14 toll-like receptor 4 complex on the innate immune cells, which then leads to activation of NF-kappa B and a whole bunch of pro-inflammatory cascades. So this mechanism of LPS immune triggering has been well studied for decades, but under the, the um, umbrella of septicemia or bacteremia. So, uh, so septicemia, this same pathophysiology occurs in septicemia. But this is, when it's occurring in metabolic endotoxemia, it's done so at a low-grade subclinical level. So basically, every time you eat food, you get a mini septicemia going on in your body, right? So that's why it can be quite significant. So this, uh, this particular uh, uh, study shows by the American Diabetic Association that if you knock out mice, if you knock out the CD14 uh, capability, you don't get an inflammatory response to LPS. So just verifying that LPS does activate the innate immune system through a CD14 pathway. Now that's important because if you start looking up studies on the impact of CD14 activation in the body, especially systemically, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of papers on how that CD14 activation causes or is at least implicated in many of the chronic illnesses that we talk about. So what are some of the clinical manifestations? 
everything within the metabolic syndrome realm seems to be associated with or in some ways driven by metabolic endotoxemia, by allowing LPS to migrate from the lumen into the basolateral circulation. And again, once it's in the basolateral circulation, I'll show you how pervasive LPS can be, where all it can get to in the body. And then, of course, all of that chronic innate immune activation leads to many of these conditions. So starting one of these studies showed that chronic high-fat feeding increases the endotoxic response to food. So if you fed somebody a high-fat diet, especially uh, a diet high in saturated fat for an eight-week period, after the end of that eight week, their endotoxic response to the food increases quite dramatically. They also showed that obese individuals versus no normal weight individuals, obese individuals had a significantly higher endotoxic response to food compared to normal weight individuals. Meaning if you take an, uh, a lean individual and an obese individual, you give each of them the same meal, the obese individual would have a significantly increased amount of endotoxin present in their circulatory system postprandially. And that's typically within five hours after eating the meal. And then, of course, you see all of the inflammatory cytokines increase as well. This study also done by the American Diabetic Associa uh, Association verified that type 2 diabetics had even higher endotoxic response to food than obese individuals. So when you look at uh, IgG is glucose intolerance, so kind of pre-diabetics, normal, obese, and type 2 diabetics. Type 2 diabetics uh, was significantly higher in terms of the endotoxic response to, to a regular meal compared to obese individuals and certainly compared to normal individuals that did not have obesity, glucose intolerance, or um, um, type 2 diabetic. And then same thing when you look at the delta, the change in endotoxic response to food compared to uh, an obese individual compared to a normal, a glucose intolerant individual compared to a normal, and a type 2 diabetic compared to a normal, what you tend to see is the black bars, which is a normal endotoxic response, you see a significant increase over that uh, with individuals with these uh, classifications and conditions. And we know that high fat feeding over a period of time does cause a dysbiosis within the microbiota. In particular, it does reduce um, bacteria like bifidobacteria, which seems to be also inversely correlated with metabolic conditions. We also see a decrease in fecalum bacteria, a decrease in acromantia. So perhaps the dietary habits that we have, the increase in fat intake, the increase in caloric intake, the processed foods, the foods that are covered with uh, pesticides, with um, uh, antibiotics and so on seem to create this characteristic dysbiosis which leads to that process where we have a dysfunctional mucosa, a dysfunctional epithelium which allows metabolic endotoxemia to take place every time you eat food. But the question is what came first, right? So we see that obese individuals have a higher metabolic endotoxic response to food. Type 2 diabetics have a higher endotoxic response to food. But do they have that higher endotoxic response because they have the disease? Or do they have the disease uh, because they have a higher endotoxic response? So in experimental endotoxemia, what they've shown is that chronic uh, metabolic endotoxemia induces obesity and type 2 diabetes. So the endotoxemia comes first, which means that you could have had a dysbiotic um, consequence from anything. You could have had a couple of courses of antibiotics, poor eating habits, stress in your life, whatever it may be that led to that dysbiosis that we talked about that now makes your body more chronically um, endotoxic in response to digesting food, and then that in itself can start to initiate the process of obesity and diabetes. For example, when you incubate uh, fat cells, adipocytes, with LPS, what you see is a swelling of the fat cells, so it actually increases in volume. So imagine you eat a meal, your gut is leaky, you have this endotoxic response, LPS migrates into your circulation, it interacts with your fat cells, especially the visceral fat, and it actually physically swells the fat cells. So it shows an increase in adipocyte morphology. There's lots of studies, this is an example. Uh, many, many of these are meta-analysis, but I'll show you a few that shows that the primary insult that leads to diabetes, the process of diabetes, comes from the active inflammatory state contributing to metabolic disease, which starts with systemic endo endotoxin levels. Uh, 
Here's another study called the Cardioprev study, which followed, I think, 462 patients who had high risk for type 2 diabetes. And they followed the patients and looked at numerous uh, parameters to, to find out the best predictor of whether or not the patient ends up with type 2 diabetes. They found that the best predictor was high levels of postprandial endotoxemia. In fact, the authors of the study suggested that using LPS endotoxemia as a, as, the, as a marker to predict the onset of type 2 diabetes. Other factors that they followed, CRP, um, obesity, blood pressure, all of these other things did not predict the onset of type 2 diabetes anywhere as close or as well as endotoxemia, the amount of LPS in your circulatory system after a meal. So that simple factor becomes the best predictor of type 2 diabetes. LPS also can cause something called central insulin resistance because LPS is so pervasive. Once it enters your circulatory system, it can end up in many different parts of your body. In this case, they showed that how it can end up in the hypothalamus and actually cause uh, insulin resistance in the brain irrespective of body weight changes. At least in the US, we're seeing more and more people coming into uh, the clinics who are younger, so people in their late teens, early 20s, that aren't obese, aren't overweight, and are showing and presenting with type 2 diabetes, right? And so this is one of those phenomenons, causing the central insulin resistance in the brain. So the communication between the rest of the system and the brain seems to be altered by the presence of LPS. This is also, uh, LPS also presents the molecular link between cardiovascular disease and obesity and, um, and uh, metabolic syndrome. So we've known for a while that you, if you are overweight, um, there is an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, but we have not really understood the mechanism behind that. So this metabolic endotoxemia prov uh, provides a molecular link showing how LPS and the chronic uh, immune activation uh, drives cardiovascular disease, especially through interleukin-1 beta. We also, here's a whole bunch of studies is showing uh, some of the impact of metabolic endotoxemia. One thing that's interesting is when you have metabolic endotoxemia, meaning you have too much translocation of LPS postprandially from the lumen into the inner part of the mucosa, past the intestinal epithelium, into the basolateral circulation, it actually drives higher levels of um, tight junction dysfunction. Right? So you could have tight junction dysfunction in some section of your bowel, but the more endotoxemia you have, the more prevalent the tight junction dysfunction will, uh, will occur. Um, elevated endotoxin levels also implicate in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's a good number of studies looking at that, and I know Cleveland Clinic has a whole department that's studying non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and the role of elevated endotoxemia uh, that starts from dysbiosis in the microbiota. We also know that elevated endotoxemia plays a role in the induction of autoimmune disease. There's several in vitro, uh, in vivo uh, studies that have shown this, but we know that polysaccharide, lipopolysaccharide can act as the environmental trigger that seems to be required in autoimmune induction for, ver uh, for a variety of autoimmune conditions. This is also quite interesting. September 2017 showed that LPS from the gut can actually make its way to the brain and induce the, um, the classic innate immune activation in the brain that leads to the placking seen in Alzheimer's. So likely a big source of Alzheimer's risk comes from having leakiness or permeability in the gut and that postprandial endotoxemia where the LPS is allowed to leak through the brain into the perinuclear region starting the process of, uh, of innate immune activation in the brain itself. And here's a whole bunch of conditions. There are roughly, I wrote a chapter in a functional medicine textbook that covered many of these. I think there are roughly 75 references that cover all of these things. This just shows you how pervasive LPS can be when it's allowed to leak through and enter your circulatory system, all the different places it can get into that it can wreak havoc in your body. For example, uh, with, law, with cognitive decline, loss of memory, it can get into deep recesses of the brain like the amygdala, uh, amygdala and hippocampus. It can interfere with dopamine binding. It can interfere with serotonin recycling in the body, uh, in the brain, sorry. Uh, it can lead to uh, chronic pain by um, interfering with dosal root stimuli, something called nociceptors that can, uh, it can bind to nociceptors and create pain signal um, uh, activation. In Parkinson's, there's a whole bunch of mechanistic studies that have shown intracranial LPS that comes from the gut and migrates past the blood-brain barrier 
actually causes microglia activation and neuronal loss that's classic in Parkinson's disease. We of course know autoimmune and the hypogonadism in men, low testosterone levels seem to be associated with increased activation of the innate immune system chronically due to endotoxemia. This is something called a gelding theory, uh, something you guys can read about. But we know in the US we see ads all the time on TV called low T because there seems to be this epidemic of low testosterone in men in their mid, uh, mid 30s and beyond. So, so many, so many conditions that can be associated and have been shown to be associated with LPS, which is a very common um, uh, you know, component of your microbiota, allowing, to be, uh, allowing the leaking of it through the epithelium and into the circulatory system. And we know stress is a big driver of this as well. This is a, um, a study that, that published showing that um, among non-communicable diseases, this permeability in the intestinal wall and the translocation of toxins from the lumen into the circulation is probably the biggest driver of mortality and morbidity worldwide. So we were looking at probiotics as a solution to stopping this endotoxemia, right? C can a probiotic be taken that could effectively stop the migration of LPS from the lumen into the circulatory system postprandially? So during the process of digestion and then up to five hours after digestion. In order for a probiotic to be able to do this, it has to have some action on the tight junctions in the gut. In the gut. And so spore-based probiotics seem to have a significant action on the tight junctions, increasing all of the Claudin and Ocladin protein expressions, the ones that make up the tight junctions, the ability to uh, completely change the microvilli, uh, the, the pathophysiology, the histology of the microvilli, in fact, increasing the height of the villus, uh, the, the ability to um, neutralize intestinal uh, toxins that seem to have an impact on tight junction function. So all of these studies have been done on animals because they've been using these spores in animal feed or animal nutrition for decades now. So we, we figured we'll put together a spore-based formula to see if it can actually reduce postprandial endotoxemia uh, by measuring LPS in the circulatory system before and after a meal. So that's what we published in um, August of 2017. We've got a bunch of studies that have followed up since then, but in the interest of time, I'll just show you this study. But this is the classic endo endotoxic response to food, right? The way we did this is we took 100 college students. These are healthy, normal, if you can call college students healthy and normal, but um, there were 100 health, healthy, normal college students. So the, none of them are obese. Nobody had any chronic illnesses. Uh, they're not on medication. They're not ma managed uh, for any sort of disease condition. Um, and what we did is we gave them a, we looked at serum LPS levels uh, in a fasted state, so about a 10-hour fast, first morning LPS levels. And then we gave them a 2,000-calorie high-fat, high-caloric meal, and we measured the LPS in the circulatory system at three and five hours postprandial. Now, those that had the severe endotoxic response of the meal had this classic curve where we see typically a five to six X increase in serum LPS levels. Well, we measured a whole bunch of other cytokines as well. I'll, I'll show you those. But if they had this type of response, we included them in the study. It was interesting to note that of the 100 people that we, uh, that we screened, we found that about 55% of them had this severe endotoxic response to the process of eating food and digesting it. So 55% of healthy normals have this severe endotoxic response. We gave them the probiotic in the pilot study for 30 days, no other changes, no other interventions, and then we measured them again in the same challenge, and we saw almost a complete blunting of the LPS response to a meal, right? So this gave us indication that it made sense to go to a larger scale study, which we did, and in the larger scale study, what we saw is in the spore treatment group about a 45% reduction in endotoxemia after 30 days of taking the probiotic. Again, no other interventions, no changes in diet or lifestyle. But in the placebo group, we actually saw a 32% increase in the endotoxemia. So it seemed to get worse over time. So there's a over a 60% difference between the two groups. So there's a significant change in the endotoxic response of the food just by taking this probiotic. In animal studies, as, as I showed earlier, it suggests that this probiotic has the ability to change the, the, the structure and the function of the tight junctions. So it's, it's doing something to reduce the permeability of the intestines uh, clearly in the uh, postprandial state as well. Now we talked a lot about metabolic syndrome earlier. Um, this is a really interesting aspect of the study. We looked at ghrelin function, 
right? So at baseline in the treatment group, we, uh, when they came in fasting, we would, we would see really high levels of ghrelin, which is, of course, normal because they're in a fasted state. So hunger hormone's going to be high. We'd give them a 2,000 calorie meal here, and we'd barely see any drop in ghrelin levels at all from baseline from the fasted state. 30 days after taking the probiotic, we see this really classic uh, ghrelin response, as you should see postprandially. So what this is telling us to some degree is the communication between the gut and the brain, where the gut is uh, indicating to the brain that we have enough food, enough calories coming in, stop producing the hunger hormone. That is disrupted in these individuals. But we were able to restore that function to a certain degree after 30 days of taking the probiotic. Right, so that's quite interesting. Now we followed this up with, a, um, with an actual obesity uh, weight management trial, and we're seeing similar response in the weight management trial, uh, including significant loss in visceral fat and increase in lean body mass without exercise, without dietary interventions at all. So just modulating the microbiota and protecting against postprandial endotoxemia can have a significant impact on metabolic syndrome. Other things that we saw, uh, triglycerides, we saw a significant drop in triglycerides after 30 days. Um, and of course, no change in triglycerides in the placebo group. And then looking at this, um, this is MCP1. If you're not familiar with that, it's a chemokine that indicates inflammatory response in the mucosa. So looking at MCP1, we saw a significant drop in that as well, which is uh, characteristic of reducing inflammation postprandially. And then this heat map shows you the overall change in several of the inflammatory cytokines associated with postprandial endotoxemia. So everything above this line reached statistical significance. Everything below this line were trending in the right direction, but the cohort was just not big enough to reach statistical significance. But what's exciting here is we see in the placebo group, um, everything got worse to some degree in that 30-day period. In the uh, spore-based group, we saw a significant reduction in really important cytokines like inf uh, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, MCP-1, ghrelin, triglycerides, and so on. So this picture, the overall health picture here is quite significantly better with just taking the probiotic for 30 days that seems to be able to modulate tight junction function and reduce LPS endotoxemia. So it can play a significant role in overall health and wellness. So last slide, metabolic endotoxemia can be argued as being the number one cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Many of the chronic diseases that kill us seem to have metabolic endotoxemia either associated with it or fairly well described as a root cause of those chronic illnesses. Metabolic endotoxemia leads to conditions like obesity, heart disease, autoimmune disease, diabetes, hypogonadism, Alzheimer's, and the list goes on. If you guys start searching uh, through uh, studies on metabolic endotoxemia, you'll end up in a rabbit hole of tens of thousands of papers, uh, which could be a lot of fun on a weekend. Metabolic endotoxemia is a feature of a dysbiotic gut, right? So this phenomenon of having increased circulatory LPS postprandially starts with a dysbiosis in the microbiota. Because as it seems, the microbiota plays a significant role in protecting us against this phenomenon of postprandial endotoxemia. And so being able to fix the dysbiosis seems to have a significant effect. It affects the immune system as well as the endocrine system uh, in conditions that lead to things like type 2 diabetes and obesity. Um, the hallmarks are increased serum LPS and LBP, and of course elevated levels of interleukin-6, 1-beta, interferon gamma, triglycerides, and disruptive postprandial insulin as well. Um, these are really characteristic features, and then of course these are features of numerous chronic illnesses as well. The, the spore-based product reduced postprandial endotoxemia and, and also reduced all of the key cytokines associated with postprandial endotoxemia, the interleukin-6, 1-beta, and so on. Even elevated triglycerides were reduced, again, with no dietary changes, no interventions at all. It also reduced, uh, as we talk about, postprandial insulin response in another study that we're doing, and, and it improves satiety and reduces the amount of food volume that people take in in, in the follow-up uh, metabolic syndrome study that we did as well. And it's a first uh, probiotic because we are addressing this concept of metabolic endotoxemia. It's the first probiotic that can be utilized for a number of conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, neurodegenerative disorders, and so on. Now it's important, I think, you know, everyone in this room deals with metabolic syndrome and uh, obesity, diabetes, and all that to some degree. We, we heard a lot about these surgical and non-surgical interventions 
maybe one of the ways that we can improve outcome for patients is to address this issue of metabolic endotoxemia either before, during, or even after the surgical interventions, right? So the, the reversion to obesity may be reduced if we can address this LPS endotoxemia and, and start to fix some of that microbiota uh, dysfunction that allows that leakiness in the epithelium that allows this endotoxic response postprandially. As we showed you in the university study, it's 55% of healthy normals that have this severe endotoxic response to the process of digesting and eating food. When you look at obese individuals or diabetic individuals, it's nearly 100%. So it has to be something that we look at and we address along with all the other interventions.